So my book, Rx, um, is about a time when I was working in psychopharmaceutical advertising um, uh, at an ad agency uh, on the Pfizer account, um, while also uh, secretly having a diagnosis of bipolar 1. Um, and at that point in my life, um, I really felt like I had no choice other than to um, pursue a career that uh, would enable me to have health insurance. Um, and I got trapped uh, into this cycle um, of, you know, taking drugs, having my job so that I could have health insurance to take drugs to have this job. And um, that was kind of the per became the purpose of my life, um, staying sane. Um, but at the same time, uh, sitting at my desk and having this reflection on, on my life and the, myself and um, the fact that I was a, a part of this, um, you know, capitalist uh, machine that was causing all of this, you know, uh, to happen um, just drove me crazy. Um, and it, it the stress of that resulted um, in me leaving my job and, um, being uh, involuntarily hospitalized. I made a promise to myself when I was in the psych ER that I would write this book. And um, that was really the driving force for many years of my life. Um, and uh, there was something about, you know, how I could tie together all of these different pieces um, that were part of this puzzle of getting me to that point. Um, to create, you know, this, this narrative um, that, that became my book. Um, so I had been making comics for my whole life, like, you know, from the time that I was a, a little kid. Um, and uh, so when I got my book deal, um, I really didn't think that there would be any issue with me translating, you know, another event from my life into a comic format. You know, it's just the same same thing. Um, but there was something about uh, taking trauma and and doing that 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 was so overwhelming to me. I I just I didn't know how to tackle it. And then on top of that. Uh, you know, I, there was this, this feeling after having um, drawn myself like as this character for so long that drawing the experience was almost like a, a complete re, uh, uh, re uh, me completely reliving the experience because this, this avatar of myself is almost as real as my own reflection. Um, like that up, up top left there is a is a little frame from my my high school newspaper strip that I did, um, and then the rest of them kind of like fold out chronologically there. Um, but that's when I I really started to learn about graphic medicine, um, and graphic medicine uh, is the is anyone familiar with graphic medicine? Okay. Um, graphic medicine um, was kind of coined by uh, M.K. Zerwick, uh, who is a nurse um, in Michigan, and Ian Williams, uh, who's a doctor in the UK. Um, and it is sort of, uh, it's a subsect of comics, um, but it's also s sort of uh, runs parallel to narrative medicine um, in the sense that uh, you know, it's, it's based on uh, using narrative to, to communicate and uh, support a, a medical experience. And um, in, in graphic medicine, that relies entirely on the connection between words and images in, in that comic format. And what that really does so well is it creates this kind of um, interstitial space where you can really like hold something like that can't that can't be said there there's just something 
about there, there's an intensity to journaling and, and then maybe some, something too abstract about painting or drawing. But if you have the, both of those tools acting in tandem, there's, there's something special that happens in that translation. Um, and for me, it wasn't just the words and the images because clearly it was hard for me to be drawing myself going through all of that. Um, what I ended up relying on is like a, a, a less talked about part of graphic medicine, which is the panels and sequences of panels and pages of sequences of panels, um, and just this structural component of comics uh, that, that helps you pace the reader's experience of, in my case, my life and my experience. And so a panel is a unit of time. And however you choose to manipulate that, is uh, helps to you know it, it can make it longer it can make it shorter um, and in addition to just the panel itself there are these does anybody know what the in between piece there is called the what, uh, oh well interstitial is good but it's called a gutter it's called a gutter okay. so so you can even tell like in just in the experience of looking at these structures you can see that like this is so much faster than that one at the top and you're you're invited to spend time with each of those panels and really like decide how much time you want to spend with each one and and that's actually uh, uh, I wish I remember who said it, but there's, there's a particular cartoonist that says the gutter is really what makes a comic a comic. I mean, the, Scott McCloud says that it's, it's, you know, that it has to be more than one, like one panel is not, not a, a comic, it's a cartoon. But if you have multiple, then it's a comic. But then there is someone else that said that, you know, gutters make it that because, uh, th because of the reading experience. Anyway, I digress. Um, so, just a little lesson, a little, little teacher time. Um, this is called a democratic grid, and in a democratic grid, all of the panels and gutters are exactly the same. And if you can imagine, like, you, choosing this structure privileges all of the information in each of these panels in exactly the same way. You could have a gigantic eyeball here and then a really zoomed out picture of like f a farm here. But there's something about the way that they're all put into the same size box that like c makes you read it in a, particular, in a particular pace, in a particular way, and gives it a particular weight. And that's as opposed to this, which is called a hierarchical grid. And you can tell that these, these boxes, I'm sorry, these panels are, are chosen to uh, indicate a hierarchy that's based on the, what the image inside the panel is. So like, you know, that, the, the one up top there could accommodate a skyscraper or, you know, something large over there. And then, you know, um, or you could totally flip it around and this could be, you know, a penny and that could be like a something, you know. But it's all, it's, it's just, think, these, these are tools, you know, these are tools that that really helped me when I was writing my book. Um, and then this also applies to stuff like integrating text. Like I'm sure people who have read graphic novels have seen um, this style of text integration. It's very classic. Um, and it also has that same kind of democratic vibe. I don't, I don't like this as much because it sort of encourages you to just read and not look. Um, there's this more integrated way that pe has become popularized now. Like this is much more more common. Um, people don't even really use uh, panels for the th for the lettering sometimes. And you know Nate Powell's work, or the March uh, uh, cartoonist, uh, he he does a lot of that. He's an excellent cartoonist, so everybody should read that. <laughs> um, okay, so yes, structure. So um, I, I spoke a little bit about what my book is about. Uh, I didn't want to give away too much of it, but at a certain point, I end up in a psych ward. Um, and so when I, 
I, I'm going to do a reading, but at, as I go, I'm going to kind of talk about like why I made certain decisions. Um, and in this particular point, um, uh, this is when I'm just first being admitted to the hospital. And uh, so it goes from this like extremely like dense, kind of dark sort of background to this completely white, you know, cinder block wall situation that I wanted, you know, this is the spread of the book, that's the crease, you know. Uh, I wanted it to, people to open it up and it just to hit them, you know. And like that, that is a choice that, that I made structurally knowing that my canvas is not only a panel, my canvas is the page and all of the structuring of the comic within it. Um, so 11N. And I requested my hospital notes when I um, did this book, which was, I will say, absolutely the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, reading those notes. Um, you can absolutely see the di diff you know different people weigh in at different times, and I'm sorry this is a you know di this is a detour, but I, I've spoken a lot about this book and I've I've mentioned the hospital notes a lot and narrative medicine. One of the things that they talk about is capturing the the patient's experience with empathy and doing it in an ethical way. Um, and to read through those notes and just see the differences between each of these doctors and nurses' perspectives on like where I was at at any given time was just like absolutely shocking. Like there was a moment where I remembered from my own experience that I got a new doctor and everything just went downhill from there. We did not get along. And it was totally clear in all of the notes. And uh, it was just fascinating. So. I knew I wanted to have them, the notes, in the book in some way. If you have ever read Girl Interrupted by Susanna Kaysen, which, yes, it's an excellent movie, but it's also an excellent book, Girl Interrupted, the book, actually has Susanna Kaysen's real n hospital notes in it. It's there, like, put the, interspersed in the book. Um, but because of the, the fact that I was writing a graphic memoir, um, I wanted to take my character that you had developed a relationship with throughout this entire book and bring that character into this, these words that are being written about it, about her, because her, me. Uh, and uh, because you, I didn't want people to lose sight of this, this character that they had developed a relationship with and feel compassion for while they read these totally desensitized statements about, you know, what I'm going through. So, patient describes hospitalization as a mind-blowing act of betrayal. She does not believe she is manic, but rather being punished by her parents for making a brave, independent decision without consulting them. And this also, I should say, you can see here, and again, anytime, like, this is just like the, the middle of the, of the book. Um, I used a clipboard uh, to also do a kind of a wink to the hospital notes, and that becomes a motif. She becomes tearful when describing how difficult it is to live with her diagnosis. She does not believe that she needs to be in the hospital. She is clearly in the middle of a manic episode. And then here, like, this is sort of a wonky democratic grid, but like, just to show the shifting, the emotional shifts that are happening in such a kind of like rapid but equal kind of way. Um, and then see here I am trying to escape this perception of who, of who I am in my experience. And you see I jump off the corner of the clipboard. Given her wish to make decisions with significant impact on her future while in this state, as well as her psychiatrist's inability to manage her as an outpatient, hospitalization is indicated for stabilization and medication adjustment. And here I just was another thing that you can do really easily with comics 
is, you know, I'm writing this, this text, this is all handwritten, and I'm highlighting these, these parts that just seem to be so ridiculous. Her wish to make decisions on her future, her, in, her psychiatrist's inability to manage her, hospitalization is indicated. I mean, just like that, highlighting that, it seems so unfair. Um, and so then this hand of God picks me up and then I'm thrown back onto this clipboard and now you know that this is where I reside. I am now a part of this piece of paper. I am a part of this record of my existence that's based on a medicalized reality. Um, uh, so, you know, another fun thing to do in graphic novels, and this is, you know, by no means a unique idea, but, you know, using a tarot card thing. And um, the fool is actually zero, so you don't need to tell me that. But, um, <laughs> but uh, here is just sort of, um, you know, a nice, a nice way to uh, use common, um, you know, symbolism to, you know, bring the reader in further. And it's, you know, this is the first step on the hero's journey. And um, in, in the Jungian uh, reading of the tarot, um, it's easier to be angry than sad. That first morning I awoke into a nightmare that had less to do with my surroundings than the complete failure of the system I had been led to believe would protect me from this fate. Despite the psychiatrists I hadn't stopped seeing, despite the pills I hadn't stopped taking, I sat tagged and over-medicated in a new prison, waiting to be corrected to fit someone else's definition of sanity. For a few precious hours, I had felt the freedom of a truly independent life, a life without my job, a life without my diagnosis. I was a fool to think it would last. I fucking hate everyone! So, you know, here, really the only thing to say is, um, you know, being able to use the drama of black and white uh, and, and that balance in the work to, you know, bring weight to this moment. This, this chapter in particular was very um, important to me. Um, and uh, it took me a long time to write it, like months. Um, but I felt like that was, that was important. Um, <clears throat> okay, club meds. So, um, yeah, club meds. Uh, so yeah, you can see just like to bring it back, like uh, the, the, the connecting tissue in this, in this section of the book is this cinder block wall page that just keeps divvying everything up. Um, every patient arrived in the hospital under different circumstances. Voluntarily, involuntarily, psychotic, catatonic, some in need of a break from the real world, others rejecting it entirely. But there is one aspect of life we all shared. And I just want to point out, like, in terms of, like, pacing, um, you know, I wanted all of these to kind of read exactly the same, like just, you know, the way that you read that is just very digestible. You want it to just read exactly with the exact weight. And then here we have a full flush to the, to the right. We have some in need of a break from the real world. And then on the left, others rejecting it entirely, like uh, completely opposing desires. And like, you know, another way of just kind of getting someone to, to you know, read that, that moment that she's having. And, um, you know, because you can, you can set up an image and a text and text in that way. And like, that's really how much thought you get. You can really, like, this is the kind of control that I needed to have in order to be able to revisit this experience. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but there is one aspect of life we all shared. As one patient astutely put it, we're all on lonesome standard time. A time zone of endless self-reflection, self-hatred, denial, boredom, sadness, anger. 
a time zone measured not in minutes but in changes in our deviation from the norm, the level of our fitness and desire to re-enter the world outside. Time passed slowly, but we passed time together. I was more of a musician then, so when I was allowed to have my guitar, mutter, mutter, scribble, scribble. And this is another like motif throughout the book that all of the, the nurses and doctors always have a clipboard. Like they're always like vigilant and they're always, there's always a scribble as if it's like kind of their scent or something coming off of them as they like walk around. Um, <clears throat> when I was allowed to have my guitar, my life in the ward changed dramatically. I played in the common room, in the group rooms, in the quiet room. People liked it. When I didn't play music, I drew cartoons. Yeah. Happy Easter! Uh, it was on the basis of these facts that, other, that the other patients accepted me, valued me. I was resident artist. It felt right. I, I thought that it, because of this audience, I, I would talk a little bit about this. Um, so I love my comic strip so much. I really miss it a lot. And uh, I, at the, the same year that, I, I moved here in 2013 be, to do my book and um, just like quit my job and moved here, like went shopping at City Market and was like, nah, I could work here. And then started working at City Market. <laughs> and, um, then I like, you know, just got so inspired by working there and being in this new culture that was so different from New York, which is where I had come from. And um, I, I, um, I started doing a blog and then the, the, I sent it to Seven Days and they're like not interested and then they were. And um, so I got into the paper the same, just a, a month before I got my book deal. So um, it was really kind of a crazy year, um, and it was amazing. And um, I, I put these up. This is like the, the old header that I had for my blog, and then the new one. And this was the first comic that I did actually on my blog. So uh, it's just like me. Uh, that, there's my apartment on Lafayette Street in Burlington, um, prayer flags, and um, <laughs> yeah, so anyway, all of my things that I'm learning about being here. Um, but one thing that I was really concerned about uh, when the book came out was like how my audience was going to react to it because it, it, was, it was so different and about a very, you know, discreet period in my life and, um, you know, it, I, it's, it, there, there is stigma and there, there, I ha also have internalized stigma and, um, you know, the idea, I, I had kind of come to this, come to Vermont in this like safe haven kind of, you know, it became a safe haven for me from like all of my ghosts and baggage of being in New York. I was like, okay, now everybody's going to know what is this going to be like? Also, can I prepare my audience for this in some way? Let's find out. Um, so, so I decided to do like a series of strips that people may or may not have noticed. That's like always, I'm always like thinking that it's like, okay, everybody's going to know now, but like nobody ever really is caring. Um, but anyway, so this is the fr one, first one in the series. Subject, New York Magazine from publicity team. Hi, Rachel. Great news. Your first interview about your book will be with New York Magazine. No pressure. Be yourself. This was before it was published. Be myself, but who am I? And then I go through this whole thing, and I think we all have this to some extent, but it's like, you know, uh, you're, for me, it's uh, my like joyous self and my angry self and then my actual physical self, and um, which interestingly, there's two drawn selves and one physical self, so I don't really know what that means. Um, interview day. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? And then this is my favorite swimming hole in Bolton. Um, and then I jump in and I come out and I'm a, I'm a little wolf. And then the next one. Hey, are you home? I need to talk. Also, I'm a wolf. Oh, you meant literally. And there's Bessie bonking away. 
yeah, well, my book's coming out next Tuesday. Might as well get used to the wolf being out of the bag. But now you get to be naked all the time. Naked is right. And then book release day. I'm getting all these texts. I'm getting all these emails. And then I'm the wolf, and I take the pills. And then I am myself, but I'm still a wolf. And I just shove it right back in. Um, so yeah, and yeah, this one is was one that I I did ended up doing later, but you know I at, at this point I kind of like know that I have different cycles of of like when I need to you know do different things with my meds and stuff, and so spring break is like here's the my wolf character coming back, and um you know, like knowing that that's ha about to happen and like chaining my myself up. Um, <laughs> the Gatorade water bottle. Um, and then, oh, and then there I am foaming at the mouth. Um, I don't know, I just like that one. Uh, one thing that I didn't say that I should have said off the bat is that the, this, the, the box, which, you know, interestingly, like the text box is, is so, like, you know, in its shape itself is so concrete. And that is representing, you know, the voice of this kind of like sober narrator character. Um, so like that, that kind of like lords over the entire story. And then anything that uh, comes out is like, you know, the, like the mutter mutter, the scribble scribble. That's just kind of part of that, that world that, you know, this sort of omniscient kind of narrator is commenting on. Um, and then, yeah, like this, this use of the, the more squiggly line, like I like to think about line work. I, I always say line is king. I think that you can do everything with line work. It's just like so incredible how communicative it is. I mean, you know, just like you you don't you can't see any motion here, but you know that these hearts just fluttered right out, you know? And the only reason that you know that is because this is this is the line. It's amazing. It's crazy. Um, and uh, yeah, so something like that like, you know, this this up there, the top panel with that squiggly line, usually that represents kind of like a flashback or something because again, there's like this, the, the, the solidity, so is that a word? Uh, <laughs> the, the way that the line is so concrete and the way that if you think that a panel, or if you're thinking about a panel as a, as a just like a snapshot of time, that's like concrete time that's happening. And then that one up there is like a, a flashback time. So that's all wiggly because it's something that is a memory. And then these panels here are the reality of, you know, th the storytelling that's, that's active. Um, but yeah, and um, another thing just like for aspiring cartoonists to think about, um, if you, like, I like to use silhouetting a lot and I, I find it very helpful, like, I could have fully drawn all of those characters, but really the only person that matters is, you know, like the, this nurse character and my character. So it just helps to bring focus to the storytelling. Um, yeah, when I started it, it was, it was prose. And then just because like I needed to write and then, and then it became comics and then it became more and more comics. Um, and uh, if, you, if you will allow me to tell like kind of a funny, st fun, funny story. Um, so I, I sold this book to the publisher with this packet, you know, like a draft that I had done that was really like funny. And, um, and it was just a much different take and it was all about the hospital. But then I decided that I really needed to talk more about the, the advertising component, which wasn't in this presentation at all. Um, but uh, so I started 
you know, you, when you're doing a memoir, you're like, okay, do I do it chronologically? Do I do it by memories? Like, I would recommend, by the way, that you like take your memory, whatever your strongest, most vivid memory is first and do that and just continue to do them and then tr figure out how they fit. But in my, um, I decided to do this chronologically. And so I, I did the whole upfront of the, uh, of the of the advertising part like you know when i had uh, in like 2016 and then when i got to the point where i needed to like enter the hospital i looked at what i had sold the book in as and it didn't work at all it didn't work visually it didn't work tonally it didn't work in terms of the way that the story was presented like there's this narrator that does this and you know it's shepherding you and I was like, oh my God, like this is, this is not gonna work. Like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And at that point, I started seeing spiders everywhere. Like, it was just like, I would look up at the wall, there'd be a spider. I would like be, get on my bike, there'd be a spider like crawling on my hand. Like spider in the wheel well of my car, coming in through the window, spiders everywhere. And so I was like, okay, what does this mean? And um, I looked it up and spiders are symbols of patience and creativity. And because they will wait and determine the best place to spin their web, and then they will spin it. And but at a certain point, they have to realize that you know they've caught as many flies as they're going to catch in this beautiful web, and they have the confidence to that they can make another beautiful web somewhere else. And so I was just kind of like, that's the message here. Like, this was a really beautiful piece of work that I did, but now I have to move forward from this and, and make a new web. So that's my extreme detour from your question. <laughs> Eight years. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I arrived in Vermont and was really gung-ho about it, and then I just, like, had a complete, like, awakening of, like, wow, I'm not in a completely insanely stressful job. And like, wow, I really love my strip and I love like doing funny comics and like, I just want to do this. And so I tabled it for a long time until um, I started uh, <laughs> house sitting for Alison Bechtel. And then I was like, I think I should probably work on my memoir. Um, <laughs> Um, but tr I mean, I wouldn't, I'm not leveraging that to be like full of myself. I'm just saying that's like literally why. <laughs> I mean, when I wrote this, I, I had, it was honestly like a revenge novel. Like I was like, I was like, yeah, like I, th this is for you. And um, because also, well, I won't get into that, but. Uh, well, I, I, one of my hospital notes said that I was delusional because I wanted to show my portfolio to the New Yorker. And not only did I show them my portfolio, I was in it. So th if I had believed that, if I had read the notes of someone who is, you know, clinically certified, which I suppose is the greatest certification on the face of the earth, like, you know, to, 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 I would never would have even pursued that opportunity, but I would not let anyone shut this down. You know, I was like ready to go. Um, but I would really want, so, so what I'm trying to say is that the, I, the fact that it's become a peer support tool has been a very surprising, but also like amazing and heartening aspect of this journey for me. Um, and I, it's also been something that has been very popular for formerly incarcerated people and incarcerated people, um, which was very interesting to me also. And um, I, so yeah, I'm trying to figure out what to do with that because I, I've been, I, I think there's a lot of value in exploring your life like through this medium and and trying to you know even if you think you can't draw just like trying to get that and that's another thing about graphic medicine graphic medicine is one of the like absolute most inclusive you know like start wherever you want to start wherever you can 
places in comics and there it's an extremely welcoming community and if you're interested in doing any work about your medical experiences or whatever graphicmedicine.org and they have stuff going on zoom stuff all the time um yeah so most costly journey incredible book that used to be it in its um in its inception these okay first off the cartoonists in this is a collection of different stories uh, about migrant farm workers in Vermont. And uh, they are both devastating and heartening, and they give you so much perspective about people's lives here that we know so little about. And um, I, the, the diversity, like this book is worth buying for so many reasons. But one of them is that the diversity of the cartoonists in the book and the diversity of their styles. And some of these cartoonists are incredibly famous now. And um, many of them are still local. And, uh, but I, I mean, this is just like, if, if you want a, a study in different ways of a, approaching visual storytelling, this is a great place to start because like you will get that and you will also get all of these incredible stories about people that live in our state and are, you know, beyond marginalized and like, you know, a secret world. Um, another cool thing about this is that it, it wasn't a book originally. It was these small zines and they were, so, you know, I remember when people were working on these because it, a lot of these people are my friends. And, um, you know, the zines would come out and they, they put them in like doctor's offices and, um, you know, to, because those were the places that if, peop if someone had to, you know, risk their life and, you know, being deported, like to go somewhere, they would be going to the grocery store or they'd be going to the doctor. And so like they would have these, um, the, the zines would just be available there. And, and here's this, this, and you know they were written in Spanish, um, and uh, you know they would uh, like in. I mean, this is just a general thing about comics. That's like why comics exist. Like the intimacy of the the reading experience of comics, and uh, you know having having this. Uh, I don't know, reflection of your own life. Um, it's really it's really powerful.